In this episode, Greg and I delve into a fascinating book written by Dr. Edmund Richardson about a private in the East India Company whose talents, ignored and rejected, braved the deserts of Afghanistan to become the foremost knowledge on Alexander the Great and Afghanistan at the time. It is a story of triumph, pain, deceit and hope. Greg and I reveal a number of relevant details from the book, but no spoiler we could reveal would take anything away from the enjoyment of this amazing piece of writing. It is so beautifully crafted and intelligently purposed, the depth of research and character building really needs to be savoured directly, and we hope you do so. Thank you, Greg, for your time. Enjoy. The podcast from Drew and Mike is, I think it's really cool, and um, that is what I wanted to say. And a mic. Greg, it's great to have you back. How are you, mate? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? Good, 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 good. Do you know, this is um, this is the fifth podcast that we've done together, actually, which is uh, definitely well, five more than we've done with our other brother. <laughs> that's actually my dog. That's not that's not the sooty and sweet dog we're talking about. Uh, can you hear that speaking in the background? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. yeah just my dog with a chew toy. <laughs> it's funny. As soon, that's the first we've heard from your dog, and as soon as we mentioned Armin, we had that squeaking yeah. noise. Um, it is actually well timed. Please compliment your your dog for that. I shall. I shall. Yeah. I'll, I'll retreat later. Yeah. What's what's it's a what's her name? Um, she's she's a whippet, and uh, her name's Stella. Stella, the whippet. Yeah. Wonderful. Was that her too, or was that somebody phoning no, you? This, this is this is hold on. This is my phone. <laughs> I'll keep the ring of how unprofessional. Okay, I can't believe it. we're getting bothered by it. Stella to the right and Joker's to the left. Here I am. Anyway, okay, good. So um, today we're going to talk about um, Alexandria, the Lost City by Dr. Edmund Richardson. Um, and so the reason why, um, or the the reason why will become apparent in a moment. But so I heard this first on uh, the History Extra podcast from the BBC and They'd actually invited uh, Edmund Richardson on to talk about his book. Um, he's a professor of history, I believe. Um, and I was fascinated by the story, um, even though I, I'm, I'm not really one of those who goes crazy about treasure hunts and finding hidden treasure and blah, blah, blah. I, I, I couldn't really I mean, I like Indiana Jones and all that, but I don't go in for the value. I prefer this, the, the sense of adventure element to it. Um, but there were certain elements to this book which really interested me. As you know, I'm I'm very much into colonialism, the history of it, um, because I think people don't recognize enough just how bad it was. So any kind of reference to that, the East India Company, immediately my my ears, my substantial ears, as you've often pointed out in the past, prick up, and um, and and I I had to then pursue that, and so I did so, um, and I was amazed as I sort of went through the book, um, and that's the why uh, I recommended it for for our podcast. If you had to come up with a a kind of an introduction, like a general but simple introduction. Where would you start? I mean, I, I think it's a book on, on on a couple of at least on two, on two or three different levels. But we talk. It's a it's a book about a man um, who absconds from the army um, and his adventures. But it's also um, it, it's it's also um, a book about Afghanistan and lessons never learned. <laughs> and and it's also a book about the East India Company and just corruption, um, and, and 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 what just just devilment they 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 brought they, they brought upon upon the world, 
um, in the name of achieving profit. Um, so uh, uh, and I, I found it a fascinating book, I have to say. Yeah, and the research, I mean, okay, um, Edmund Richardson is a, a history professor, so therefore there should be no doubt as to how much research must have gone into this. But it, it is fascinating because his subject matter is this individual, this Charles Masson. Um, the area is India, Afghanistan. But on top of that, he goes into so much detail. He talks about Armenia. He talks about Iran. Um, you know, he talks about historical characters. This is horrible Italian colonel, Paolo Avitabile, you know, as in the kind of variety that he brings in to this story makes it so complete in many ways. He talks about ancient Greek philosophers because of how they um, they rejected Alexander. They said he wasn't a Greek. He's just a Macedonian, you know, and, and, and these are things which when when people now come to read it, they would consider that to be quite surprising because now everyone wants to claim Alexander for their own, don't they? Uh, yeah. in many ways. So it's really interesting hearing this completely different insight into what was. Yeah, no, I mean, again, Alexander is very much considered a, a Greek hero for most people today, but Macedon was not part was not part of Greece. And, it, you know, Alexander wasn't a Greek. Um, I, I did love this book. I, I loved it for its for its detail. Um, you, you almost got you really got to know the characters involved. Because the, the author has a fantastic turn of phrase. It, it's so beautifully written. I, I, I seldom have I heard so many positive words to use to describe such really negative people and situations. You never actually know which way he's going with his description of, a, of, of, of an event or a person until you get to the end. Because so often positive words are used and then you get the twist at the end. And you understand just the kind of person you're dealing with. And often it's, you know, you know, it's people in, in the British Army or or or, leg, or, or legislators. And it, 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 it's just it's some beautiful terms of phrase. I I I, I picked out a few uh, that I wrote down um, during the book. Just if you don't mind, I can bring them in. Please, here. please. Um, so Harlan, the first American in Pakistan, brought with him the first American sponsored jihad. I just love that. <laughs> um, Burns was charming and ferociously optimistic. He had the energy and enthusiasm of a puppy. Unfortunately, he also had the discretion and morals of a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just love it. Now, it, 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 uh, it, it, it it's, it's superb. Um, so he described an East India house in Leadenhall Street in London. From here, India was governed greedily and uneasily. Secrets and scandals and money poured through its rafters. The management met in a fantastically appointed room with high vaulted ceilings and caryatid supporting columns. East India House was loot made manifest. Here, curiosity and wonder met capitalism and bureaucracy. Curiosity and wonder never stood a chance. That's I, great. I, I, it's, it's superb. I, 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 and it, the, the, the book is riddled with that. I mean, it's, it, 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 those are just a few examples. There are so many others. Uh, I, I, I loved it for that because when, whenever a new character was introduced, that's the way he would introduce them. He, and so often, uh, he'd almost boil their, um, their, their personality and existence down to a few sentences, which, which really gave you a, a kind of flavor of the person you're dealing with. And then he, and in, in the story, what they what they went on to do would be very much explained by that 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 kind of explanation in in in, in the way he brought them in. I, I I love that. Yeah, there's an element of um, a sort of Shakespearean element to it as well. I mean, I when I when I read some of this, I thought to myself, for he is an honourable man. Um, mm -hmm. And and I thought, oh, okay, yeah, cool. You see that uh, you know the, the way these people are being described. Okay, honourable is one thing. Um, but what they do is, well, the reputation doesn't necessarily match the actions and of these people, does it? No, no. I, I mean, I, th I think that he's he, he's being um, is a very deliberate device he's using to to show how in history Solomon may well have been written uh, written and shown to us all as being an honourable man, 
indeed doing his job for the East India Company or the army. And yet, because history is written, as we as we know by the witness, um, it may not accurately describe that that person or or, or the things that, that that they did. Whereas if you you know if you if if, if you were um, either in Afghanistan or India at the time, or indeed um, if you have if you have papers which are, were set down by those who were, you may find out exactly or certainly more closely the the, the character of people um, who were being discussed. I, it, this is the thing. Um, we don't really know so much of what happened in India and, and, and Afghanistan and that area, especially under the, the East India Company. And this really starts to throw a light over that. And it's so fascinating to know how business was conducted in those days. Um, and unfortunately, how little has been learned and how business is not really conducted that much better today in, in certain areas of the world. In, in, in certainly in, in terms of diplomacy um, and, 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 and putting forward national interest in order to get what you want done, whether it's whether it's because you want oil rights or just because you want to have influence or, or even just money, as straightforward as that. Or, or even not even national interest. Um, the East India Company essentially was there for its own shareholders um, and yeah. and uh, yeah, the nation be damned. If I'm not mistaken, um, at some point in the 18th century, when uh, Britain was looking to finance its wars uh, in Europe, it borrowed borrowed a million pounds from the East India Company. In return, the East India Company was given royal license to do whatever it pleased in India for 20 odd years. But this isn't for a, a donation to the nation's purse. This was a it was a loan. So not only did they have that royal, as it were, monopoly on um, whatever they wanted to do in India, but they were going to get that money back anyway. Mm -hmm. As in. So it kind of makes you wonder who involved in that decision making process was also actually a shareholder, because let's face it. You're you're getting that kind of monopoly for nothing, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and again, I mean, these these scenarios are played out through history, and they go on today. If you look, well, you know, we're still talking about contracts which were awarded by the government. Um, let's just, let's take it to you know to, to, to more modern history. Um, during the COVID crisis, they had they had contracts given out left, right, and centre to people who are either related to or friends of people in government. And you know, th there are so many questions. Um, and, and, and that's just one instance, but it, it goes on. It goes on today and it, it, you know, it, it's a level of corruption which should not exist, but we, we all know it does. Yep, yep, definitely. So once again, this refers back to, as you said, lessons not learned um from from history um it was also interesting that the, the quotations that you used because i'd also noted this india uh, east india house was a loot made manifest that that will stay with me um a, a, as the kind of building block for any future podcast or workshop that i may do which pertains to colonialism and e or, you know, liberalism neoliberalism um because these are essentially the um the principles uh, b behind how and why people are motivated to do the things that they do. But I mean, that's far too personalized. Let's go back a bit, because also what you said before, this is a book about a book as well, but about the preparation of a book. Um, and it involves so many stories and also misrepresentation. Charles Masson, he was a deserter. I mean, you said he absconded, but he was a deserter. He had, um, and the East India Company never forgot a deserter. Mm. Um, they would find you and they would kill you. Um, in the book, also Edmund Richardson talks about how all of a sudden back in Britain, people were getting worried about, you know, what is the East India Company doing? They are, you know, they are murdering um the indigenous people of uh, of India, they are treating them really badly. Um, there were rumours of how people were being fired from cannon and so on. 
And the East India Company responded, absolutely not categorically. This never happens and so on and so forth. Um, and then what would they do was they would line people up, Indians, in front of a cannon and fire a cannon, mm -hmm. essentially beheading a certain number of people. And this was done to the amusement of the leaders of the East India Company in in India. Yes. Now, I remember that, that, that passage at the, near the beginning of the book and his description, again, was, was beautiful. And he, he, he mentions about the carrion birds who were circling, follow, following the, you know, the, um, the party which were going to, to conduct this um, horrific execution. And the carrion birds would follow the party um, flying around because as the person was blown to pieces, they would catch the, the parts of the meat before it hit the ground. Yeah. Um, horrific, but you know, so so graphically um, described. Yep. And and also this, it's an important lesson for us to learn when we talk about misinformation, when we talk about propaganda. These are, if not the beginnings, but these are the masterful developments of that particular method of waging war, of pursuing foreign policy interests. Yes. Um, and what I have what I have to also state, in my opinion, is we haven't changed our fundamental racist opinions, in my opinion, because over centuries, Europeans have been taught they have received information back from these colonial areas saying the people here are savages. They are barbarians. They are they are brutes. They can't read and write. Um, they are this, that, and the other. The reality, though, is the absolute opposite. The brute, savage barbarians were the colonial aggressors. Yes. The That's others yes. had culture. The others had had their languages. Of course, they did. They had their their centers of learning and education. It's just that the people who went out there didn't give a shit that wasn't what they were there for mm. well that again this is so well described in the book um he talks about he talks about um of afghanistan and in, in particular i think it was background that he was talking about um where he said that all faiths were welcome in the city um they had mosques and they had churches it's it was kabul it was kabul, kabul. yes I was, I was thinking was it was it i was wondering whether, whether it was kabul or both but he was describing it as saying that they had all different faiths all were welcome and the the leaders did not tolerate any kind of violence between you know using faith as an excuse they it was it was everything was done in a fair way until the europeans went there funnily enough right i mean yep. again these are not things that we you know that we that we like to talk about but it, it's it, it seems that um, and even if you go back to, to, to the first Crusades, um, if you see where the violence that that began um, in, in, in between between the faiths, the, the way that we waged that war, I say we, I'm, I'm obviously talking talk about the first, second and third Crusaders, the way those wars were waged, the violence was never forgotten. And you, you could you could argue that that violence has been meted, meted out in a century since. Um, Yep. From, from from all sides. But we certainly Christianity is not blameless when it comes to that. Uh, and and in, in, in the name of Christianity, what what has been um, the violence that has been wrought around the world certainly seems unchristian to me. Yep, definitely. Um, lacking in any kind of moral fiber. It's also we're, we're jumping around a bit, but I think it's because we have to draw parallels between the past, the book and also present life. If you look at some um, laws which are being uh, entertained in the USA, and I'm talking about the Woke Act or Unwoke or whatever they wish to call it, um, where they want to remove certain subjects from colleges, universities, schools, because they don't want to teach people about divisive topics. They don't want this to be included. They don't want any particular race as it were or demographic to feel guilty for past crimes they don't want any kind of responsibility to be accepted this is because they are aware of the horrors of those uh, actions of the past and they don't want to teach them what is interesting for me whenever i speak to people in 
in mainland Europe where I live, whenever I speak to people from India, I spoke with a gentleman three or four weeks ago at a bar. Um, and, and I talked about this. I brought up the topic as well. And um, and he was also surprised to know that in my education, and I'd like to hear what yours, yours was like as well. Um, in my school, they never taught us about the horrors of colonialization. They never taught us about the horrors of the East India Company. They talked about the slave trade, but only it was quite vague it where removed. it began. It was they, removed. It was removed yeah. in time and history. It was it was part of the term a whitewash of, of of the slave trade and and what and what it was for. Of course, you know the, 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 that, that's a whole other a whole other topic, if you like, and we could do probably do a whole a whole series of podcasts on that. But I have to say that I, I agree with you. In when I when we were taught history, of course, we went to the same school. But um, when we were taught history, I remember it was we we touched on the Tudors. We did we did some very small amount on the Victorians, but it was mainly about it was mainly about how London got got its water system, um, and then we did medicine through time. Oh, and, um, and there's a parallel there because we learn about Robert Koch's germ theory of disease and we learn about Louis Pasteur's pasteurization technique. But they yeah. never tell us that Robert Koch killed hundreds of Africans in testing, you know, some of his theories. That is never, never, that's never taught. And in fact, when you go to look online to find out more things about this, it's very hard to find references towards Robert Koch's past. I didn't know that, for example, about uh, uh, what. So can you explain, can you expand on that a little for me? Yeah, basically, he went out there because he had certain theories about how to uh, look for, obviously, germs, but at the same time, also testing uh, medicines for how to counteract some of these diseases. Uh, and he would essentially test these humans in uh, villages in Africa would be his uh, testing bed, basically. And uh, yeah, a lot of them died as a result. So when, so when during the pandemic, and I'm not only saying this is the only reason, because after the the Second World War in the USA, for example, a lot of um, black women had went in for medical procedures and had certain parts of their body removed so that they couldn't have children um, completely without their knowledge. So when during the pandemic, there are some communities that do not trust medicine, there's a bloody good reason for that. And there's a very long history for that, too. Um, And so, you know, when people want to consider why there are certain beliefs that exist today, those beliefs were not created from nothing. They stem from a very clear unfortunate historical precedent which is that essentially white Europeans would go into these areas as we are talking about in this case with the East India Company and immediately consider themselves superior not just ability wise but having greater value uh, than these other human beings that they visited. No, I, I, I agree I agree entirely I mean um, clearly you've done a lot more reading around around those specific um, areas and I the, the details I'm not aware of but um, I, nothing surprises me nowadays unfortunately the more the more you read the more history you get your hands on um, and the more particular professors obviously know that know, know what they're talking about the more of their books you actually pick up and read about things you thought you already knew about the more you understand that really um, what is handed down to us um, is it are fables a little more than fables um, and we're expected just, just, you know, just not to ask any questions and go away, and, you know, and, 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 toe, and toe the line. Um, I mean, on, on that um, on, on that note, even some of our most famous archaeologists did not did not uh, come away unscathed from this book. Do you? And that was brilliant. Yeah, 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 yeah. Please feel uh, free to. Yeah. So um, probably the most famous of all is Heinrich Schliemann, um, who, who, you know, as we know, discovered Troy. And I love the way he described. <laughs> he, he says he says of Schliemann, now nowadays historians are divided between those who think he was a liar and those who think he was a pathological liar. <laughs> <laughs> he swindled the Rothschilds with dodgy shipments of gold dust. 
he wrote a horrifying account of surviving the San Francisco fire of 1881, despite being nowhere near San Francisco at the time. <laughs> when he found the cache of treasure in, Tro in Troy, he dubbed them Priam's treasure. They were nothing to do with Priam at all. Schliemann was not a subtle excavator. He favoured dynamite. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently he thought that the um, the very, to get to Troy, you had to get to the very, very lowest level um, of the Trojan site. But in fact, he overshot by almost a thousand years. So he said, today Schliemann is celebrated for discovering Troy. He actually destroyed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, because you talk about a, a man that you know there are statues of everywhere, including in Greece. There's there's, there's a statue of him um, on on the, near the Parthenon building because he's so well revered worldwide. This this huge figure in, 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 in you know his history and archaeology, and yet he just blew stuff up. <laughs> it's, it's, it's it is but. There was another, I think, a British guy that he referred to. I was getting to that. Arthur Evans. Oh, okay, he, sorry. Yes, he, yes, yes. So he, was yes. About, he was talking about the, um, he was about the Palace of Knossos, which I've been to, and like <laughs> everyone else, if you, if you read the blurb on the side, it tells you how you know, how great they were. Um, but he's, you know, he, he, the professor here goes on to tell you that not much remains of the actual site of Knossos because of the way Evans um, and and his team went about things. And I love this turn. He said to the phrase that. Um, Evans's team, Evans's men worked in two shifts. One was for finding the antiquities, the other was for copying them. So basically, they used to turn, they used to turn out huge numbers of artifacts because they'd make them and then and, and then dip them in acid for a certain amount of time to make them look old and weathered, and they'd get away with selling them. <laughs> And uh, th 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 this was discovered. I mean, Evans, I think, was arrested because one of the workers on his deathbed, yes. <laughs> he confessed to, go there, look at all the tools. Yeah. You yeah. can see yeah. everything there. That's true. That, yeah, again, I, 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 I love that, you know, mm. so, so uh, the, the, the unmasking the magician, as it were. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, but this, again, this uh, attests to... That the level of uh, research uh, Edmund has uh, amassed over the years, um, and I mean these references to the archaeologists, it it adds a bit of joviality. I think he probably added that to the end of the the book because of, um, yeah, it became very uh, distressing in some parts, uh, especially towards the, the the conclusion and what happens with Masson. But again, I before I I kind of um, uh, allowed myself to digress when talking earlier so charles masson as uh, yeah, he's labeled by the east india company as um, as a deserter um and so therefore a coward but charles masson accomplished things that yes. no coward would even no. consider no no he he, he i mean the, 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 those first sort of harrowing years that he spent crossing India and Afghanistan in the way that he did, the beatings that he that he took, um, the, the the privations that he that he suffered, he, he almost starved to death on many roads. <laughs> he had, he had, literally, he was he was he was he was left with absolutely nothing. He was beaten and, and robbed so many times. Just, he, I think he had his underpants and nothing else at one point. It was it, the poor the poor man who, who arrived, I think, in Kabul. De destitute would be, you know, would be a, would be a reach. <laughs> well, the thing is, what was crazy about uh, Richardson's uh, description of events is that the when he turned up to Bagram um, and to these other places, they did not believe that he could be somebody so low, despite the way that he presented himself, because there's no way anybody like that could have survived under those circumstances he had to be somebody special he had to have had some kind of access to something uh, and was simply uh met with infortune on the way yeah i mean that that i mean the thing is that i i, I guess the way the way the book tells the story suggests that he was someone special and you get that more and more toward the end because he's he started off so in such a, from such a lonely place and yet, because of the time and just how horrible most other people 
um, and useless. Many, many, many of them in, a, in, in the British East India Army were. The, the sheer level of arrogance um, and incapability that they showed. Um, the locals are looking at this man and he's a shining beacon in comparison. Uh, and, and yet, of course, you know, he has nothing to show for it. These other guys, they're, they're so great in self-aggrandizement and, um, and, be, and, being a, and being able to kiss the correct bottoms and, 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 and say the right things in order to get ever greater salaries. And, and of course, rob the locals blind at the same time. This, this man is not attempting to do that. He wants to find proof of Alexander's city. He wants, you know, he, he spends his last month, his, you know, his last pennies to, to, to buy artifacts and coins from, from people who are bringing them to him. And they've kept these things hidden because they, they anticipate the minute they show them to someone, they're going to get beaten up and have it removed from them. That's what they're expecting. That's, that's how they know that the East India Company operates. They don't pay for stuff. But, and then they find out this, this man is actually paying the money for it, for, for, for these artifacts. And they've got, all of these people got them just lined up at home. They just sat there in, in drawers or whatever. And they bring them out and they bring them to, to and he, he buys them in the hundreds. He, he, he forms a huge collection of artifacts of what would have been an Alexandria, somewhere near Bagram. Well, I, I believe it, you know, it, still, it, it still remains a, a little bit of a mystery as to exactly where. Yep, Alexandria beneath the mountains. Um, Indeed. Yeah, and, and in fact, as you allude to as well, um, I, I'm not sure if I have, because uh, I was listening to the, the audio book twice, which is actually narrated by uh, Edmund Richardson himself. Um, and 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 I and I've so I've made a note of this line. I'm not sure exactly how much of it is uh, verbatim, as it were. But ineffective, pumped-up jackanapes are made regional or city governors who know nothing of diplomacy, culture, decision-making, or respect. Um, I think that's far too brutal a sentence, and so therefore probably I uh, added that were my reflections on what was explained uh, in the book itself. But that's basically exactly what you're saying people of position of influence in british society would send their nephews or their kids or people that they liked as it were um, paid for some kind of commission they would yes. then become some kind of um, high level operative in the east india company and the east india company to be honest they didn't give a damn if these people survived or not they were sent to some kind of uh, area to to represent the organization and if they did well wonderful if they didn't it's okay they got the guy's commission yes yeah it was it was it was, it was, it was hardly what you'd call a fair system um but you know it, it's not very different to the, to, to, to the roman system of governorships again you, you know you are either a friend of or you you paid money into the treasury or to, to someone you know who, um who you knew and they would and they would arrange for you to have the right uh, posting where, and and the, the idea was that you, you you know you might pay a certain amount to get a posting, but the the really good postings could have you, you could make you extremely wealth, wealthy because as you're collecting taxes, you, you, it's accepted you'll be pocketing a good number a, a good number yourself. Um, and I, I guess this system was based very much on that. Yeah, I think so. Um, it, it's just that what is um, particularly uh, unfortunate is the 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 long lasting diplomatic damage that ensued as a result of the incapabilities that these people so often you know carried with them um you know if you if you go to a country or a city and you have zero respect for the people it's very hard to develop a meaningful relationship with them yes and again in the book he describes when um where Masson is trying to plead with um, a, a particular army officer or, or, or a governor um in, or to say look if you just speak to them, they will hand you their country. You do not need to wage this war. And of course, they don't listen. They go ahead and wage the war. And of course, it, 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 ends, it, end, it ends up with their ass being hand back, handed back to them. But, you know, they, they, were, they were more than willing to listen and be and have an active part in helping the East India Company um, actually attain their, um, their desires. But they weren't interested in that because it had to be attained through warfare for them. Because otherwise, it you know, I guess their name doesn't get set you know set out in lights in London if they just had a meeting and and, and had something was handed to them like that. Whereas if they want win a military campaign, um, it does it does wonders for their reputation and name. Mm. Yeah, indeed. And there's one quotation from such an individual: "Might is right." Yeah.
that was very much their privileged, arrogant approach to any kind of uh, dispute or challenge. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it doesn't end well. No. Yeah. No. Um, on top of it, it hasn't seen Karen up the Khyber. Mm hmm. Yeah, indeed. And the, I think it's the, in the Khyber Pass, as it were, where this um, Italian uh, colonel uh, has established himself as um, just a horrific, a horrific character. If anybody wants a definition of uh, barbarism, then they should look up um, the name of Paolo Avitabile. Um, he's a horrific character. I have heard also um, or read about stories of um, British mercenary leaders who went to Italy and also conducted wars for the Florentines. Um, and they also committed barbaric acts in Italy, too. Um, and, and these are characters pretty much lost to history nowadays. But they did certain things in certain regions which have allowed reputations of nations to develop. Um, mm. And um, yeah, Paolo Avitabile is uh, one such individual. Well, we, we shouldn't gloss over the fact that the, the, uh, the, the very reason for this book, Alexander the Great himself, was known by those who he conquered as being pretty barbaric himself. Um, so I, I guess that's at the very, the very, it's the, it's the cornerstone of this book. And I think it, you know, I, I don't think it's by accident that he he shows that Alexander did these things in, in, in such a barbaric way. And they kind of still were still being done by the East India Company in similar barbaric ways nearly 2000 years later. I, I think that's an interesting point to highlight. Definitely. There are so many, um, indeed. The fact that Charles Masson was such an adventurer but at the same time he was perhaps the foremost archaeologist uh, and he had the most knowledge about Alexander the Great at the time because of the work that he had done and this isn't somebody who had trained in uh, a university or who had been uh, raised by a, a museum curator or something like this this is a person who of his own very simple understanding of what should be went mm. and did research, cared for the work that he was doing, patiently, painstakingly observed what he could see before him. And he also um, was able to decipher languages which up until then, what nobody could understand what they were he found keys to deciphering these things it's amazing yeah i, I think that was um that was because of the the, the language on the coins being yeah. on the on the reverse in, in 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 a language that could be deciphered and the, the the original language um on the one side which no some you know were in various different languages that had never been seen um but because of the the language on the reverse side me having the same meaning, he was able to decipher what the letters were. You're, and you're right. Um, and in the book, the professor highlights that Masson, that Masson was not an archaeologist or historian, is shown by his digging methods and the fact that he had never heard of Theodosius II or Leo Constantinople. So, you know, the, no historian would not have known two, you know, two, two of the most famous kings of, Const of Constantinople. Um, but he, you're right in that, although he didn't start out as a historian, he, cer he certainly uh, understood uh, far better than most of his contemporaries about the need to firstly work with local people rather than try and, um, try and bully them into helping him. And then, and, and, and then to show um, some compassion to the site that he's working on as well, the area that he's working on, in order to keep the history within it rather than destroy that as well. And th there's also this interesting way. I mean, normally when when I sit down to read the, a biography or this kind of historical, a true historical account, it's a bit like a, a, a written documentary, as it were. You kind of say, oh, but that's going to lack drama. It's going to lack this and that and so on. OK, I can guarantee there's almost no sex in the story. 
um, at least none which you could say is, um, how would I say, describe it as acceptable forms, because they talk about some of the sexual desires uh, of some of these individuals, um, but not in a, a, a very positive sense, I think it's fair to say. Um, but what there is, is a hell of a lot of drama, because you know, the injustices visited upon Masson by the people who he has to work with, he expects support from these people. They promise him support, but they use him and they abuse him. Um, the work that he has done, the the coins that he has amassed, the history that he has produced, and it all is used by others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I mean, he truly is a victim in this book <laughs> from beginning to end. You know, just when you think he's got himself sorted out, something something happens. Normally, it's is it you know either through fear of uh, the East India Company or because he'd be, he's being discovered by an element of the East India Company, and you know eventually they got they get to him in the end, of course. Yeah, and one of the sentences that Stan has always stood out for me because I've I've listened to this audio book twice now, uh, and, and I find it fascinating. I will do so again, I'm sure. In 1833, Kabul is one of the world's most tolerant cities. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, a lot has changed in the last 190 years, but where it was, naturally, how it had itself developed without foreign interference, I, I think is interesting to make that uh, statement. Yeah, I, I also, that, I, mean, I, I, tried to, I tried to allude to that earlier, but um, yeah, you're absolutely right. That, that idea that Kabul in you know 200 years ago nearly was so tolerant of all kinds of people and faiths. I mean, of course, Madsen did get beaten up you know, amazingly on his way there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, had, it had its moments, but Indeed. Um, <laughs> yeah. but I guess you you could be stuff involved anywhere, right? Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, of course. Um, one final point from my side uh, with regards to Masson's work, because I think the more obviously we've um, there's going to be a spoiler alert on this book. But even even if we tell you everything that happens in this book, which can't be the case, um, it's still worth reading or listening to, because exactly as you say, Greg, the way it's written um, and the detail of research, but it's not detail as in like oh god this is boring it's such a chore no it's the detail is exciting because it's presented yeah. in such a fantastic way you don't feel as though you're reading um a historic document or a manual you feel as though you're reading a living story that masson is in the room with you um it really is really really well written as in mm -hmm. I, I couldn't compliment yeah. it more than that very well written and beautifully observed. And the the way the the, the, the way he uses language um, is so humorous and so unexpected in so many ways that it, it, it you know you, you you have to read you have to read or listen to the whole sentence or paragraph before you understand where he's going with it. I've got one more which I've just I've just found uh, of his beautiful turns of phrases like that. So I think he was talking about Harlan, uh, the American, when he said he bluffed his way to a job as a surgeon, armed with little more than a saw and an unshakable self-regard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, not the kind of surgeon I'd like to visit. But um, <laughs> no. yeah, uh, no, absolutely. Um, I, what I wanted to say was Masson's book, which he agonized over, which he suffered over. Um, the reason why a lot of people have not heard of Charles Masson and why I had never heard of Charles Masson was that his account essentially was buried because the East India Company did not want the truth of what was happening in India and Afghanistan mm -hmm. to be made known to the people in, in the UK. They wanted their narrative and their narrative alone, which was that the, the East India Company was bringing culture, was bringing investment, was bringing organization and structure to a region which sorely needed it. And what I find amazing is that this belief still exists, that we gave them 
what mm. they needed. They should be happy with Absolutely. what we did. And people mm. still say this um, and are sh so short sighted as to what happened. And recently in the, in, the, in the last few weeks in the USA, there have been Republican politicians that have come out and tried to say there was a positive side to slavery. And I find myself what absolute bullshit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and so there are parallels also in this yeah. kind of story, isn't there? What I mean, what the post side of slavery is what exactly the the the, the, the slavers in Africa who they were paid? What what, are, who, what where is the post side of slavery? That, you know, it, I'm sorry, that, that that's that's not that's not even an argument. No, that's that's just that's just you know that's just someone being being an idiot. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, we've more or less yeah provided conclusions, but I've, I've asked you in the past if you were going to recommend this to to somebody who likes history, um, what would you say? How, how would you motivate them to read this book? I would I I, I would call this book um, an eye opener to a portion of history that has that has been glossed over and hidden from us for two hundred years. Um, the, if, if you like, it's as close an account of the true story of what was happening in, in, within the East India Company um, with regards to India and Afghanistan at the time. And it's written and observed so beautifully that it feels and reads almost like a novel when it isn't one. And you, 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 know, you actually get to know the protagonists in a way that you would in a novel because of the way they're described. Um, and so you, you take an interest in their story rather than it, than it just being a piece of literature that describes what happened in history it's much more than that because of the way it's written yep and, and i would also say for for lovers of ancient history there is a lot of information about alexander Absolutely. um and also about persian dynasties um, yep. i think there's also an element which talks about genghis khan um so there's a lot of fantastic history from the ancient period also to be appreciated in in this book yeah, I, I'm I'm with you completely. I I couldn't recommend it enough, to be honest. Yeah, I, I'm I, we're we're 100 in in agreement on this. No. Um. So you also listened to the audio book. Just uh. Just just quickly then. Um. When I first listened to it, I found I thought to myself, Oh God, that is such a delicate voice. Um, yes. How on earth? Because normally you get these when you listen to audio books, you get this very gruff, very and he took out his, I don't know what, and did this and did that with XR, blah, blah, blah. And and this is completely different. Mm. But in the same way that his language was or is uh, delicately aggressive, his voice is softly strong, mm. isn't it? For the same reasons. I, I, I agree. I, and when I first listened to it, I actually, I actually found the, um, the voice a little difficult to, to, to get on with. Um, at the very beginning so um, and I think it took me a couple of chapters to, to but when you but I think he's the ideal person to read the book specifically because he's the one that's written it and he knows he knows that the words that he's describing he knows what he meant to say so he delivers the lines beautifully uh, but it, it, it's not very it's not very easy to get that from the, from the very off so I, I would ask anyone, I would urge them, who's, if they're doing the audio book, give it time. Because it, you, as you say, Zach, it's not the, it's not the normal voice you, you, you'd expect to hear on an audio book. It's very much more subtle. Yeah, yeah. but as you say, exactly, beautifully read. Um, and uh, the, the intonations, the humour is so expertly delivered as a result. I think um, so. Yeah. Yeah. I think it'd be difficult for someone else, especially the gruff voice, it wouldn't work. The, the, the level of humor that, that we've been discussing and describing here um, is because it's read by him and it's hit there. They're his words. I think that that comes across in the reading. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and also we were talking a bit earlier with regards to audio books um, uh, and, and so on. I find once you can overcome the fact that you're not turning a page or flicking a screen here, left to right and so on. Once you overcome that and you allow your ears to be the input device rather than your eyes, there is an extra dynamic that emerges because it's no longer simply a question of the book and I. It is the book being presented by 
a third person and I. And so therefore, I feel there's something more to it. There's an additional interpretation, an additional voice automatically, which I find very, very interesting. I, I really like it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I never used to listen to audiobooks. It's something I've, I, I've started doing in the last couple of years and I actually really, really enjoy it now. As, as, I, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, before we started recording, I, I actually normally have one or two books on the go at any one time and an audiobook now. I enjoy the various medium, yeah. uh, but audio audiobooks have definitely become a very good delivery method for me to, to you know to accept, especially when I'm doing something where I, I, I may not have the ability to use my hands or sit down and have read. You can put, pop on a set of headphones and off, off you go, and, and you can you can listen to an audiobook for an hour and you you know and, and get on with, with other things. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's the only way that I can do it um, in a sense that I would not be able to read as much as I do were they not delivered with audiobooks i can listen now i think i listen to about two sometimes three audiobooks a week depending on the length obviously of the audiobook um there's no way on this planet i could read more than one book every two or three weeks there's just no time but now whenever i when i go somewhere or if i've got half an hour you know a home free to myself or when i go cycling um then I've got the audiobook playing. Or if I go for a run, I've got the audiobook playing. And and I can do that. I can focus on what's being uh, explained. It's hard to read a book when you're running. It, yeah, that, yes, yeah. Especially if there are trees nearby. Definitely, definitely, definitely. And the other cyclists didn't appreciate the book either. No, um, no. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, cool. All right, so basically this book gets the, get the, gets the thumbs up, if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely. Cool. Um, and you've got a recommendation for me now, Greg, I believe. Yes. So our next book, um, I've chosen Demon Copperhead, uh, which is a book by Barbara Kingsolver. Um, and it's, as the name slightly suggests, it's a, it's, it's a take on David Copperfield, as I understand it. And but it's set, it, it's set in the southern states of the US and I. I know not very much about it at this point, but I'm I, I'm putting that forward as our next read, which is wonderful as well because there's um, there's a bit of a, a beautiful harmony in that in the sense that I found this book via a podcast. Which podcast did you come to know this book from? I honestly I can't remember which podcast it was, but it was um, I believe it was a, a podcast on radio, on radio four, uh, or just a radio program on radio four, and they were discussing the book and I and, and they and they had the author on um, and they're talking to her about her book and it just grabbed grabbed my attention so um, I've chosen that for our next our next read wonderful okay cool uh, I look forward to to reading that as well then or listening to it as the case may be Greg thank you very much for your time um, I appreciate the fact that you even you took notes you uh, drew quotations from this book that can only tell me you loved it it's true i did love it yeah I, I, <laughs> I, I, often i found myself chuckling as you're doing now to to <laughs> one line another I've got, and i just thought i have to write this down um <laughs> I, I was compelled to do so by the author and, and and his sense of humor very good very good brilliant greg thank you very much for your time again um, and for your your insight and your yeah just the way you you observe these things it's it's different to mine um, uh, but I value it all the more for it and um, yeah until the next time thank you.